Hi, all. These are generally conversations between adults after the children have left the table. The language can be spicy, and the subjects can get saucy. So if you're ready, this is the Southern Fork. Unscripted kitchen chats, and also studio chats, with some of the most interesting voices in the culinary South. I'm Stephanie Burt, a food and beverage writer based in Charleston, South Carolina, who travels with her fork to write for a variety of publications, from magazines you might have on your coffee table to the website you love to visit for your favorite recipes. And I'm inviting you to come behind the scenes with me to get to know the people who make this Southern culinary landscape so special. I'm always hungry for the next bite, thirsty for that next sip, and ready for the next conversation. Let's dig in. The Southern Fork is presented this year by Townsend Automotive in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. The Honda CRV has been my favorite vehicle in Honda's lineup for years because it has great gas mileage and can haul a vintage furniture find with ease. In fact, it's so easy for getting out there in general, from the beach to the mountains to even the next photo shoot for a Southern travel article. Purchasing a CRV from Townsend Honda means purchasing from a family owned company built on service and connection with its customers. And they want to remind you of the joys of a jaunt down the road. Visit townsendhonda.com for current inventory, or if you're in West Alabama, stop in. Townsend Honda salutes local entrepreneurs from restaurateurs to podcasters, and they welcome you to be part of a community that does the same. Paw Paw season is almost here. From late August through October, the largest native fruit to North America and growing wild over many parts of the South begin to ripen. These fruit are in the custard apple family, and they're enjoying a culinary renaissance. So, to learn more about these wild edibles, I turn to Sarah Beer, the author of the Pocket Pawpaw Cookbook, just released with beautiful illustrations and plenty of ways to utilize your foraged fruit. Sarah is a chef, writer, and self-professed plant nerd. Her book, The Fruit Forager's Companion, won a 2019 IACP Cookbook Award. She's a graduate of the Culinary Institute of America, an editor for the website Simply Recipes, and her work has been featured in Savour, Lucky Peach, and Pace Magazine, as you'll hear. And she always leaves me inspired to read more, cook more, and get out in the natural world more. Welcome to the Southern Fork, Sarah. Steph, it is so great to be here with you. I can't believe that we're here together. We've only ever been together via email and in digital content. (laughs) That is true. I was in Charleston once a number of summers ago and had a Jack Burger. What is the place you recommended me to go to? Oh, Little Jack's Burger. Yes, yes. So um, I, I felt like we were interfacing that way. But once again, it was not it was not in person, but it was uh, closer than digital. I know. So this is closer than digital, but still not in person. But I'm so excited to talk with you today. For Southern Fork listeners, Sarah was my first, should we say, national editor. Paste was a national magazine, right? <laughs> yeah, sure. We could even say global. Global. Let's use global. It makes us sound fancier. So, um, and, and I really feel like the height of my reporting then was the food of dirty dancing. Do you remember that article? Yes. Yes. That is a perfect one to talk about in the summertime, actually. And I actually heard from a chef earlier this year who used that article to plan wedding food for a dirty dancing themed wedding. 
Wow. How did that make you feel? Well, it, it made me first think, what is he talking about? Because I had no recollection that I wrote it. You know how we are, little factories of content. And then when I went back and read it, I felt great. Like somehow I had made somebody's day better. It, you know, I had made my obsession of rewatching Dirty Dancing somehow work. It makes sense. So. <laughs> <laughs> Well, all you Southern Fork listeners at home can look up that recipe on Pace Magazine. It's not a recipe, silly me. It's um, You're just talking about the foods in the movie, and it's still out there. But Paste is a pop culture website, so that was a perfect thing for us to have. It was so delightful to have you writing for the site. And, well, thank you. And yes, now we're going to talk about how we've it matured into our careers. <laughs> Well, that is such a pop culture thing. And then it's like, Sarah, you ran to the woods. <laughs> I did. I think back in those days. So let's see. I live in Ohio, so I am I am not a Southerner. But I, my dad did grow up in Florida and Louisiana. And we used to vacation every year on Edisto Island. So, mm -hmm. um, And yeah, he took me to Florida a couple times. It was always my favorite place to go when when growing up. It was it just seemed so much better than Ohio. And that's why I moved away from Ohio. <laughs> I moved back to Ohio in 2015 and I started walking around in the woods here. And the first thing I started foraging for were pawpaws because I'd never had them growing up. I didn't know they existed. I'd learned about them when I was living um, in Portland, Oregon at the time, and they don't grow there. So it was like the big foot of fruit. It just didn't seem like it truly exist existed. It was mythical. And when I moved back here, I was walking around on a trail near my daughter's preschool. So I would drop her off and I'd sneak to the trail a little bit and have some me time. And I was on that trail and there was a pawpaw smashed right in the middle of it. And it has this bright saffron colored interior it's like a creamy yellow color and it doesn't look anything like what you'd expect to see in the middle of a trail in ohio so the smashed open ripe papa i picked it up i thought oh it has to be one of these the next day i went back and i tasted one and papas were a gateway for all of my foraging so i've always loved to go to the woods and walk around and, and just look at things even in cities i i look for plants and it all started with me falling in love with pawpaws. Well, and pawpaws are really good, as you say, gateway plant, because they're hard to mistake. Um, you know, like, I don't want to start my foraging job by understanding the differences and some of the mushrooms. But pawpaws are pretty unmistakable in, especially when they're fruiting in the forest, right? They're, they're, much bigger than a lot of other fruit that is growing there. And they, they're they ubiquitous. What is kind of the region? Can you tell us about that? I can. I thought you probably could. You can probably tell us a lot about pawpaws. <laughs> you guys better like pawpaws because otherwise this is going to be... <laughs> um, well, there's always something interesting to, to hear about pawpaws, even if you don't care for them. Because they're fascinating plants. They grow from east of the Mississippi and um, in the very southern parts of some of Canada, and all the way down to northern parts of Florida. But within that range, you're not going to see them everywhere. They like specific habitats. They are understory trees, so they will be growing out in the wild under other taller trees. So um, a mixed hardwood forest is oftentimes where you will find them. They also don't grow at altitude. And that's why if you're up in the mountains, you won't see pawpaw trees. You may run across pawpaw trees, but you won't know they're pawpaw trees because they don't have any fruit on them. Sometimes they just like to grow as trees and they don't bother making any fruit. And that's because the fruit is secondary to their reproduction they send out um, runners, right? And they, they grow in these big colonies that way. So the fruit is like, it's almost like an afterthought to them. And that's probably why I didn't see pawpaws when I was playing in the woods growing up. There just weren't that many in the woods where, where I happened to be at the time. But now in that same woods, that's in my mom and dad's backyard, they do have pawpaw trees. And that's not because anybody planted them. It's probably because some deer ate some pawpaws and then 
pooped out the seeds, the seeds took root. And I am very delighted to say that for the first time ever, there was a pawpaw growing on one of those trees last year. So I got to have a a homegrown pawpaw, so to speak. Well, that's interesting because it is cultivated and, well, it it does reproduce in two ways, those runners and the seeds. Um, But I think what's so exciting about pawpaws for people like me is they kind of are in that same category that ramps are in and chanterelles are in, that they're they're part of the trifecta of foraging. Yes, yes. Pawpaws are not super difficult to cultivate. It all depends on on where you're growing them. I know people in California who try very, very hard. My take on it is if you live in California, everything grows there. So you can miss out on pawpaws. It's fine. Like We're allowed to have our thing. <laughs> That's right. Just give us one yes. thing. <laughs> um, but they don't travel well. So that is one reason why you don't see them very often at farmer's markets, unless maybe a farmer has pawpaw trees on their land and it's just handy for them to bring in some pawpaws that they picked up that morning. They bruise really easily. They only ripen on the tree. So you have to harvest them when they're perfectly ripe. Mm -hmm. There are a bunch of reasons they're just not friendly for, for shipping and schlepping around. So that's one reason why we haven't seen them very much um, in places like restaurants and markets and, of course, grocery stores. They're just not the most user-friendly fruit for for cultivation or for food preparation. And we've really learned a lot in the past decade about varietals of fruits and vegetables that we have in the supermarket are just the tip of an iceberg of what grows in our region or can grow in our region. And it does go back to more often than not to the rise of truck farming, right? And shipping and big, bigger regional grocery chains and things like that, right? Yes, so very much. So the coolest thing about pawpaws to me is that it's a a rediscovery mm-hmm. of something that we have had all along in, in these places where we live. Um, and I, I should mention, if you live in the South, it doesn't necessarily mean there are going to be pawpaw trees growing out there. There may be somebody who cultivates them. I I would say in the Appalachian region is where they thrive the most. So parts of Kentucky, parts of West Virginia, definitely parts of North Carolina, parts of South Carolina, like I'd said earlier, parts of Florida. It's it's kind of scattershot, but there's what I call a pawpaw belt. Mm -hmm. And um, it kind of dovetails with the, the rust belt, if you can think about where that is. And it goes further south of that as well. Um, I wish I had some sort of awesome map. It would look like a big camouflage blob. (laughs) It would look kind of like a pawpaw, which is a little (laughs) bit like a blob. But Mm -hmm. um, the reason they're so worth finding is because they're really delicious. Um, I had my first pawpaw in Chattanooga, Tennessee and right off the tree. And it is creamy and tropical and not what you think at all of what I would term like a Appalachian fruit. You know, you think of something like an apple or berries. This is, this is a lot more like um, a banana in consistency when it's ripe. So I'm sure that when you are writing the pawpaw cookbook that you had to come up with some ways around their particular, shall we say, quirks. (laughs) Why do people not cook with them more? People eat them and then they make ice cream a lot with pawpaws. That's the most common things I see. What about you? Mm, I Pawpaws go so well with dairy. And because you said, as you said earlier, they have this creamy texture. They And they pair well with custardy food. So that ice cream usage of them is is really pretty perfect. I don't think you can go wrong with that. So that's why you so often see pawpaws with ice cream. I mean, what's so cool about them is they're so alien. And I should mention very briefly that it's thought that they came up here from the tropics because of large land mammals that are now extinct. They came over before the continents had been, had broken apart all the way. You know, So they'd poop out these seeds of, of other plants in that same family, which is the custard apple family. Uh, Sheramoyas, I believe, are in the same family, um, and some other 
fruits I should remember, but they're all tropical fruits. So that, that accounts for the tropical taste. You really should have prepared for the Southern Fork test, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I right? So I should mention that I am a foraging enthusiast, but I'm not a pawpaw expert. I just really, really love them. So when I get around with other mm-hmm. pawpaw people who are super duper nerdy and they propagate them, or they're just really into botany, I am very quickly over my head. But they're oftentimes so happy to have a receptive audience that there's no judgment there, <laughs> right? Like I just, I'm just a cook who likes plants. Right, right. <laughs> um, but that accounts for that that tropical flavor. So you've got these great top notes. You have uh, citrus zest kind of tastes. You have pineapple notes. They're very, very aromatic. They're a little bit floral smelling. Um, of course, there's that banana vibe to them. Banana mango is oftentimes a, a way you hear them described. So they have all these fantastic flavors. What are you going to do with them? It seems like you could do whatever you wanted. Like any recipe where banana works, you could use pawpaw, and that's not necessarily true. So when you heat pawpaws, all those top notes dissipate, Mm. and there's sometimes a funky back note with pawpaws. Now, if I'm not mistaken, when you had pawpaws in Chattanooga, those were cultivated, correct? Yes, they were on an urban farm, Mm -hmm. and the the tree was, was very much more of a shrub. And the pawpaws were small because they were living, they weren't in the understory, you know? Yes. Um, so actually, sometimes, if probably they were small just because they happened to be small. I don't know if it was a particular cultivar, mm-hmm. right? but when people cultivate pawpaws, they often plant ones that were bred to have larger fruit and mm-hmm. certain flavor characteristics that are that are cleaner tasting. So what I call mongrel pawpaws, which are the pawpaws out in the woods, the wild ones, they can sometimes have this back note that's kind of funky, which which I like, but I don't like it when it's too funky because then it's kind of like, Bleh. like they can taste kind of rusty sometimes. But the ones that have been bred to cultivate, those tend to have cleaner tastes. Um, they're a little bit more broader in appeal. If you can say broad appeal when you're talking about pawpaws. Sometimes when you grow them in full sun, which would be the case if somebody's growing a pawpaw tree, um, cultivating it versus just having them in the woods on their property, uh, the fruits will actually get bigger. So it could just be that that cultivator doesn't have very large fruit. There could be a, a whole a whole slew of factors, actually. But I do know that they can get really big when the trees are growing in full sun. But the ones in the woods, you just it's just anybody's guess. Right, right. So when when I do cook with them, what are some of the things I need to remember? It's always best to consume them raw because that's when you get the best flavor. Um, and once again, the the minimizing of that that funkiness. So that doesn't mean you can only use them in uncooked recipes. When when I first fell in love with pawpaws as as a chef, um, so I should say that I am. I do a bunch of things, but I am a recipe developer mm-hmm. and I teach cooking classes. So I have this whole like cooking component in, in my background. I wanted to have recipes that highlighted what's good about pawpaws. And all of the recipes that I found online were these old timey recipes for quick breads, um, like pawpaw cake, pawpaw breads, the ice cream, as you said, which is like a OK, thumbs up on that. Pawpaw pie. And if you make a pawpaw custard pie and you add pawpaw pulp to your custard as you're cooking it, you're just muting everything that's great about the the pawpaws. So I think the best thing to do is cook a base and then let it cool and then add the pawpaw pulp to the cooked base. There is a tomato, green tomato chutney recipe. So you cook the green tomato chutney and then I add the pawpaw to the cooled chutney. Um, it's more like a salsa. It's really great for dipping chips into. Mm-hmm. So it works terrific in in that kind of application. Um, and if you're making pawpaw ice cream, add the pawpaw pulp to the cooked base. The pawpaw ice cream in my book is made with raw eggs, though it's it is uh, it is an uncooked custard. And I don't know what it is about the specific properties of pawpaw, but um, I made a cooked custard base. And then I found this old French vanilla ice cream recipe that calls for raw eggs. And I thought, well, let's try it with this. And it was just amazing. 
I also have a mayonnaise recipe in there, right? Like make mayonnaise from <laughs> from raw eggs. I think that that is one of the most ingenious recipes because it adds this flavor. It adds like, you know, a fruity tropical note to whatever you're using mayonnaise with. And I can see, especially living in on the coast in Charleston, South Carolina, that would be really good on a fish sandwich. <laughs> you are correct with some kind of uh, really citrusy slaw, right. right? That's like dressed with lime juice, maybe. Yes. Or even just a turkey sandwich. You can use it in prosaic things. Um, something involving shrimp, it would be good mm -hmm. with that. I know it sounds really whack to have a pawpaw mayonnaise. One of the reasons my book is not that long, though. So every every recipe I put in there, I put in there for a reason. I have definitely had projects that were work for hire projects in the past where sometimes there's a recipe that's like, well, we have some space to fill up. <laughs> yeah, we need 50 recipes and we really only have 43, but here's seven more for you. Yes, yes. So all the recipes in the book are in there because I think they are worth making or eating if it happens to be the type of recipe that appeals to you. There's there's just no need to have more than 50 pawpaw recipes. I think the book has a 30 something. And you really like them. You know, for most people, you're going to not encounter pawpaws that much. You'll get, you know, and it's a slow burn of a love, right? So first you have a pawpaw, then maybe you want to look for them, then maybe you find them. A farmer has them. You know, this is a relationship. So you might only need a few recipes a season for pawpaws, but it's fun to have the variety. Yes, exactly. That is a fantastic way to to put it, Steph. And I like the idea of it being a relationship because it really is. Any plant mm -hmm. that's a wild edible, any wild edible you build a relationship with because I think of it at this as, as this way. Every time I carve a turkey, I'm like, how do I do this? Because I only do it once a year. Right. And it takes years of having Thanksgivings to move through that turkey with confidence. You have to reintroduce yourself to the turkey and rebuild that relationship. And that's the way it is with wild edibles because they only come around once a year. So every time Papa's come around, I have to reacquaint myself with them. And I, I love that process. I have to remember what they taste like and how to look for them. And then we fall into step and it's like hanging out with a friend I haven't seen in a while, but it took a little bit to get to, to that. Um, but that whole process is, is part of the point. Um, I want to ask you a question that's just more theoretical, but I think you can speak to this being a recipe developer and a forager. Both of those things require confidence in yourself and trusting yourself in the kitchen and also trusting yourself to choose ingredients, right? In the wild. How did how did you develop that confidence? Because some of us have a hard time um, deviating from a recipe to learn how to adapt it, right? And others of us, this person speaking, really love forage food, but don't feel comfortable choosing my own. Oh, that's a great question. I would like to say, first of all, it is totally fine to enjoy the concept of foraging or to enjoy foraged foods, but have no interest in doing it yourself or no, I don't want to say confidence, but it's okay not to forage. You can also just be a plant appreciator because I think that enriches your life to, mm -hmm. to know that there's stuff out there, even if you're never going to harvest this thing. If you walk around and you look at Queen's Anne, Anne's Lace and somebody tells you, oh, you know, those seeds are edible once they dry up and they make almost like a bird's nest shape. Um, I should mention that Queen Anne's Lace is in the carrot family and that has a lot of- Right, the wild yes, carrot, yes. right? Um, but that family has a lot of toxic and poisonous lookalikes out in the wild. So it's one of those things I'm, I'm not very casual about. Um, recommending people to to run around and and forage for things in the carrot family but if you at least know oh hey isn't some, aren't some of those things edible it, it's a hint that there's this whole other world living in tandem with us and it's not only the things out in the wilderness because and more or less there is no wilderness we are wild things and we have shaped mm -hmm. nature around us but nature also shapes us so 
wilderness is the it's the weeds growing up in the cracks in the parking lot where you're parking your car. That's wilderness asserting itself in a place that we thought we had dominated. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes we reassert ourselves. So there is a there's an access road um, for the power company through the woods where I go to get my pawpaws. And every year they go and they just mow down all of the uh, all of the black raspberry <laughs> brambles and and everything in the path. Right. Like it grows up really thick. And then at the end of the summer, they come and plow it down. It makes me sad. But then it all grows back up. So we're part of this whole world. We're not separate from it. And and wild foods are are part of you. They're part of us. Mm -hmm. So whether you feel anxious about them or not, they're they're still part of you. Um gosh, how you know, I think I'm just a little bit bolder than than some other people, but I also love to do research. So I when I learn about a new wild edible, which um, I learn about sometimes via social media, Instagram's a great platform for forging happy people. It is. I know I've met such a community of people that are interested in edible plants through Instagram. Yeah. Yes. And you can just learn little dibs and dabs of things. You don't have to learn everything. You just know that it exists. So um, let's see. The other day I learned about smooth chanterelles mm -hmm. and the ones we have growing here are usually ridged ones. But my friends from West Virginia were visiting and we went out mushrooming and it just rained. It was really hot. So those were like perfect chanterelle growing conditions. And we found a whole bunch of chanterelles, including the the smooth ones. So my friend pointed it out to me. Chanterelles are really, I have like five mushrooms I feel very confident foraging for. And all of them are ones that I learned from being with these friends. So Going out with people who know what they're doing mm -hmm. is is the best way to learn things. Um, and I think that gives people confidence to branch out on on their own a little bit too. But I usually cross-reference with two guides. So I love I love books and I have um, plant ID guides and I usually look things up in one or two of them. Having a plant ID guide around, it's funny the more you're into foraging, the more of them you have. It's like you can never have enough. It's not the opposite where like, oh, I don't need those books anymore. Well, and that that is the same when you have cookbooks and you're someone like me. <laughs> yes, it is. And yeah, I'm the same way with recipes. I go off track. I don't want to say off track with them, but it's I've been cooking for so long and it's just very natural for me to make substitutions based on what I think will be better or based on what I have. And increasingly those substitutions are for foraged ingredients. And oftentimes it's just a little bit of something. So people have this idea that foragers go out and they get all kinds of food and come back and I don't know, make this foraged meal. And I don't think that's largely the truth. You're bringing back little dibs and dabs of things and it's, there are items that you dry and you use as seasoning or you infuse into an oil or another liquid. I like to think I eat something foraged every day, but it's not because I am bringing back pounds of mushrooms or I went out and I wrestled with a groundhog. <laughs> There's just a lot to eat out there. And if you walk out there, you're probably going to come across something you can take home, right? Yes, yes. And, and safely. Mm -hmm. Or like I said, you can just leave it there and know that it exists and appreciate the foraging other people do. That's 100% that's cool. Well, good. I feel absolved then because that's exactly what I do. But um, you wrote this book. It was definitely a labor of love. And in a year where you had to do a lot of that on by your lonesome in the kitchen, what is now making you hungry? Where are you excited about next? Do you always have a project in the works? Oh, gosh. I always have a project in the works. I can't help it. I realized I need them to keep me going. I think there are some people who just have that impulse. <clears throat> you may be one of them, I'm guessing. <laughs> Whatever. Keep going. This isn't about me. <laughs> uh, foraging makes me hungry, but in all the senses of the word. There's something new to see every single day. And I go out on the same trails and the same paths in my neighborhood, the same sidewalks and routes over and over and over again. And every time I see something new, whether I can eat it or not. So I saw a cicada and I should mention, these are not the 17 year cicadas. It's just the, the ones that don't come out yet in mass. So there was a, a, a cicada that was molting 
on a tree the other day. And I, you know, you can eat cicadas. I didn't eat the cicada. It was just cool to see, right? It's just right. a tree in my neighbor's yard and there was a cicada on it. And then if I kept going straight, oh, there are two fig trees, which don't grow very often here. So these are fig trees that these neighbors selected because they um, are more cold tolerant. And I would say in about a month or two, probably two months for us, um, they will be ready to harvest. And I steal a fig from one of those trees every year, just one. It's kind of a jerky thing to steal a fig. I shouldn't even be talking about that. Um, <laughs> so it's it's the discovery the in, discovery. in what seems like it's the mundane, right? The discovery and delight in the mundane is what makes me hungry. And that's what keeps me foraging. You are a writer as well. That was beautiful. <laughs> what is one aspect of this job that really, honestly, Sarah, you are making up as you go along um, that really meshes with an aspect of your personality, like a puzzle piece? Oh, gosh, Steph. I love reading cookbooks and I love researching. And when I am eating by myself, I just grab a cookbook from the shelf. I have many, many cookbooks. And I flip through it. And that's how I get ideas for things. When I am working, working, I mean, I almost feel like I'm always working in a way that I usually don't um, have any regret toward. But when I am working, working, like paid getting working, um, I always cross reference with old cookbooks. So if I'm looking a recipe up online, then I will look up a recipe in a cookbook, um, especially older ones. We're always thinking things are new and that these ideas are new trends, but oftentimes things happened ages ago. Somebody else did it way before us. And I, I like seeing how things are cyclical that way. So that is immensely pleasing to me as a food and recipe authority. <laughs> what is one thing that keeps you up at night? Quick fire. Uh, books. I I, yeah, I sleep really well lately these year, um, last couple of years. You sound so calm. Yeah, so I'm glad I don't have a great answer to this question. But every now and then I'll be reading a book and I can't put it down. Um, this book didn't keep me up, but I have been reading it before bed. And it is Mastering the Art of Soviet Cooking, which came out, I think, in 2013. So it's a part memoir and part history of the food consumed in the Soviet mm. Union throughout its existence. And a lot of it's about famine and culture and politics, um, tragedy, devastation, war. It's, it's, it's a gigantic scope, uh, which is probably why I actually um, fell asleep a couple times reading. It, <laughs> it was not keeping me up, but uh, yeah. So, Hey, if you guys need to sleep better, just keep a book at your bedside and, and read that instead of looking at your phone. And I, it'll, it'll I do just it. Lull you I do sleep. it. Um, now, finally, even though we haven't met in person, I am sitting inside my miniature walk-in closet and you're sitting inside your walk-in closet too. And I have a picnic basket in here. I reserve it for Southern Fort guests. It really is a dream meal. Um, with it, I can time travel. I can go back and conscript anybody to make a special thing for you that you would like, that you remember. I can source for you. And for you, Sarah, I can forage successfully. I will not bring you anything that's poisonous. I would love to bring you some of your favorite things in that basket, just a meal that would bring you joy. What are some things I can bring you? Oh, wow. So this is not a meal. It is just an item. Yeah. And that is a fruit I have never been able to eat, but I have seen many, many times, and that is mayapple. So are you familiar with mayapples? I am. Mm -hmm. Yes, they are a little perennial plant that almost looks like a small green parasol and yes. they do make a fruit so they grow in the same kind of places where pawpaws grow um mm -hmm. they like shady little maybe lower like open meadows but also in the woods they will form a fruit railroad tracks oh my area railroad uh -huh. tracks yeah mm -hmm. i should mention that all parts of the plant are toxic and the fruit is toxic until it is ripe and oftentimes the fruit falls off the plant not all the plants fruit but when they do, it looks like this little oblong, shiny green egg. It's a couple inches long, usually. 
and it has to ripen on the plant until it's a little wrinkly and yellow. And it's supposed to be insanely tropical. So at that wrinkly yellow point, you can eat the plant. It's got a pulpy inside. I think you're not even supposed to eat the seeds. I've never seen a May apple fruit get to the point where it's okay to harvest and eat, but I've been told that they are just incredible. So I would love to eat one at some point. Every season I go out and I I pay attention to different May apples and I see that they have fruits and then I circle back and look for them, look for them. And usually there's some critter out in the woods that gets to it before, before I do, because I don't live in the woods, right? Like, (laughs) right. Yeah. So that's, that's in the basket. (laughs) We'll have May. Okay. Lovely. Lovely. Um, are anything else? I think people can appreciate pawpaws without ever tasting them. They, you, they can be your may apples. It's okay. Um, mm-hmm. You don't have to experience everything directly. I think we have this idea in the world that we've got to try this and we've got to try that, but there's a ton of stuff wherever you are that you haven't tried. And you just kind of have to realign your sensibility to learn about it. That's what pawpaws indicate to me. They were there all along until I blundered across them. So there are many tastes in the world that I might not encounter, but that was one I wasn't counting on. And it enriched my life so much. So I hope there's something out there for everybody that they'll stumble across that will bring them pleasure in ways that they hadn't expected. As long as they're walking and looking, right? (laughs) (laughs) Well, if people want to learn more about Sarah and the Pawpaw Cookbook and all of the things that she does from being my boss on occasion to recipe developing for cookbooks that I end up writing about to all of the other ways um, that she makes a living as a creature in the world, both in and out of the woods. You can go to the southernfork.com. I'm going to have links there, um, as well as an image of the face behind the voice. We had to work on some technology there as two people who have written extensively about pop culture. Took us a few rounds to get the right size image, but we got it. So if you like what you hear, I find interviewing other people about food extremely fascinating. And so I have built um, an archive of more than 235 episodes so you can dive in and hear what they have to say as well. And then maybe get inspired to make pawpaw mayonnaise. Thanks so much for chatting with me in your closet today, Sarah. (laughs) Oh, Steph, this has been a delight. You are welcome, and I've enjoyed this so much. Me too. Hello, and welcome to Talking With My Mouthful. Today, I'm just going to share something kind of personal with you, and it it is that you have heard me talk um, just on this episode about not being very comfortable being a forager and serving other f- people, but there are three ingredients that I am comfortable foraging for, and they are blackberries, mulberries, and loquats. And blackberries will always have a special place in my heart. I grew up in suburban Charlotte, North Carolina, and the street my house was on was a steep hill. And at the top of the hill, or railroad tracks. And they really fueled my imagination. We could wander up there and I would look um, down the railroad tracks and um, be very careful. Trains would come, of course, sometimes by the tracks. But there was just always something interesting to kind of explore right there. And things would grow wild on the edge of the tracks. And When I got into high school and um, graduated from high school and was in early college, I um, began picking the blackberries at the top of the hill um, of my childhood home and right by the railroad tracks. And that was the first jelly that I ever made uh, with my grandmother. And that's who taught me how to make jelly. And the last time that we cooked together, I had picked. blackberries on a very hot June North Carolina day. And um, I took them to her house and I said, Granny, I want to make jelly. And she did not want to make them make jelly that day. She was tired. And um, yet I rallied her. I was so enthusiastic about 
taking this forage fruit and using it. And I will never forget how proud we were after that jelly was made. And I think that's something that even though I'm not ever probably going to be comfortable foraging for a lot of the things that I am fine having chefs forage for and then feed me, um, I will always look for those blackberry brambles on the side of the road. So there's a big wide world in between only buying things at the grocery store, only growing your own food, or only foraging. And sometimes it's just full of blackberry brambles. Thanks so much for listening, and I hope that you have a good week. I will talk to you soon. You've been listening to The Southern Fork. I can't wait to bring you more culinary conversations, but in the meantime, I have one question. Are you going to eat all that? <laughs>